experiencing tech issues to contact their teacher, make sure the teacher's aware, make sure the principal's aware. That's very important. They're the folks that are going to be able to address that concern quickly. Um, you know, but, but overall, um, I, I, I can't say how thrilled, you know, I can't say enough how thrilled I am to have kids physically back in school. It was, it was so great. And it was so great to just to see their faces coming in and seeing their teachers and, and just being very excited. And, um, you know, so, so we're like I said, two days, two days in, two days in folks, you know, so we got, uh, we got a lot of time left to, to try to, to hone everything and, and to get people, um, more uh, comfortable and acclimated. Once again, I think our staff is doing a great job. I think our parents are doing a great job. I think our kids are doing a great job. Um, so we, one day at a time, one day at a time. That's we well actually what we say is minute by minute, day by hour by hour, day by day, because you know that's that's where we are. Um, but I think it's going well overall. I'm mean, very encouraged and excited. Um, but you know, we 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 remain cautiously optimistic as we as we continue to move forward. Uh, so we'll we'll go from there. Um, attendance uh, for the for the first cohort of kids has been outstanding. We have about uh, forty percent, give or take, of kids uh, who are slated to be in uh, each day, and and it's interesting because you know we just because the AK thing and the, the LZ thing doesn't always split right down the middle, you know. So in some cases you might walk in and you might see a class that has five kids in and you know twenty kids at home, and then that'll flip on 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 the Thursday and Friday. But in many cases it, it's pretty evenly split. And I think the teachers are just doing a great job of trying to embrace it and, and do the best they can with <coughs> what they have. And, and um, you know, there's no doubt that, that I think things will also improve once our webcams get, get here, because that will just make for an easier situation. But certainly, they're doing the best they can with, with, what they, you know, with, 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 the, uh, with the technology that they have, and I think they're doing, they're doing a great job. Um, but the attendance, like I said, the attendance at the schools has been more like 97, 98% of the kids uh, are, are, have arrived and who said they were coming, which is fantastic. Uh, so we're excited. Um, and, and there's just, you know, we're hopeful that this is going to propel us to, to you know, continue. And, you know, in a, in a few weeks, we'll, we'll see how things are going from a health perspective. And, uh, you know, if we can start following our plan and bringing back, um, you know, in more of the kids, perhaps, you know, the youngest the kids pre-KK, if we can get them to a four-day-a-week schedule, that's our, that's our first goals, uh, as outlined in our plan. So, you know, that's, that's, we're, we're, we hope to follow that timeline, we'll know within a couple weeks, uh, hopefully, if we, if we can start doing that. So that's very exciting. Uh, one other thing I, I also wanted to mention was, um, you know, our athletics, uh, and I think Janice, you asked about middle school athletics last week, so I wanted to give an update. That's really starting uh, this week um, uh, with um, physicals. The physicals are, are happening this week. I think today was one, and, and maybe Thursday is the, the other group, uh, one for each cohort. And then Monday, practices, tryouts start uh, for, for, this, for the uh, fall uh, middle school sports. Um, every team is being uh, every every team that is scheduled to field a team is fielding a team. Uh, however, it's my understanding that for soccer, this, the, the lower grades, there's not a there's not really competition, so they're going to do they're going to do intramurals primarily. Six, seven, the eighth grade will be participating and playing. Um, but that's that's okay, you know that, that's, that's that's okay. Um, and that's, you know, that's going on across, there's not, I think, a league that, that they can participate in. So that's happening uh, this week, which is great. The one thing that, that we're working on, though, is, is we're talking about attendance at our, at our varsity sports. Um, and, you know, I'll be coming back to the board next week with, with some thoughts of, about that. Um, you know, N, uh, NJSIAA has put out that the, the outdoor, you know, max is 500. That doesn't include the participants in the team participants. It does not. It does not, hmm. right? So you can have 500. The, the thing that we're talking about, though, is is that, and you know, it, 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 can we safely put 500 people in our stands and, and in the two stands? You know, when we did graduation in a social distanced environment, it was 250 in the home stands and about 125 in the away stands. You know, we are still responsible for maintaining social distancing and. Um, you know, so I don't know that we're going to be able to, to follow through on full 500 to be able to come. But we certainly want the, the families, the, 
families of the players, the families of the cheerleaders, the families of the band. You know, we're not going to have that student section in football games like we traditionally have, you know. Um, and football is probably the biggest concern because that's what draws the biggest crowd. We won't have a snack bar open, you know, there, there's, there's going to be things. So we'll be putting out the expectations for families. The first game, I want to say, is the first weekend in October. Um, and I'm not even sure if that's a home game, but that, that's when the season starts. Um, but I just want to kind of just make everybody aware that this is something that, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about and making sure because, you know, we don't want to have a situation where, I mean, we, we can only have 250 kids for graduation, you know, we, we, we don't want to necessarily, you know, how do we have 500 at a, at a football game? But, you know, we want to make, and we are simulcasting, just a reminder, we are going to be simulcasting the games. So even if you're not there physically, you can watch the games as, as you know, we watch the graduation. So we're very mindful of it. We're making sure that, um, we can, you know, try to have as many people as we possibly can safely, um, but just want the public to be aware that, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a different spectator sport this year, you know, than, than it's been in the past. So we'll keep you updated on that. Okay. Thank you. That's where we are. Yeah. Can conclude? Okay. Um, can I just say something? Sure. Yeah. So um, on uh, Friday, myself and Irene took a tour around the All right, stage, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of detail that goes into making this thing run. And I just wanted to commend everybody who was involved in that. You know, all the signs, all the plexiglass, you know, everything was, you know, I think, and I mean, you could kind of, you know, compliment, with, uh, you know, uh, compliment some of the things I'm saying, but I kind of thought it was well thought out. And uh, for as much as you can cover all the bases, it felt like a lot of the bases were covered. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to commend everybody who was kind of involved in that. I thought it was very well done. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. I mean, I know the building you know, the building principals and their teams worked extremely hard with their pandemic response teams to, to, to go through these things and the staff and, you know, the first, you know, that was part of the other reason, you know, of, 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 de of delaying was to, to get people acclimated, get people back by, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more time to just get people prepared for that opening. And by all accounts, you know, like I said, the, the operations of opening went very smooth at, at, all, at all the buildings. Um, you know, when we were walking around, I think you would attest that, you know, how many, how many staff members are still in the building at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, a Friday afternoon. getting prepared, and, and absolutely, so, Above and um, we walked to the high school, uh, but I can tell you the other schools are the same way, and, I'm sure. um, you know, they, they absolutely were ready for, to welcome our kids back, and, you know, I commend their efforts, and, and they really did a great job, and, you know, the parents have done a great job, I'll tell you, the kids are coming, they're masked, they're, you know, there's, to my knowledge, there hasn't been um, a lot of argument about it. You know, I mean, the kids have done a great job. I, I, I call up, um, you know, our middle, our, our principal. The first thing I said, how was lunch today? How was lunch today? And, you know, it, I think that's the toughest part for the kids because that's where they, they tend to be the most social and they want to be more social. But they've been doing a great job. I mean, Ms. So Kasuba. Did anybody, did anybody try to turn their chair around? I don't know, Ms. Kasuba. Was, did anybody try to turn their chair around? That was my big question. Did anybody try to turn their chairs around? I don't think so. Good. Not yet, okay. maybe, but but you know, I mean, I think that um, you know the big, the big you know, they're trying to alternate who gets who gets to eat outside, and you know because not everybody can eat outside based on the, the numbers, but um, you know it's just great to have kids back. It's just it's just great to have them back. This is where they're meant to be. They're meant to be in our buildings with with our with our teachers, um, and we look forward to the day when we can have that one hundred percent across the board. Uh, hopefully that's sooner than later. That's that's the goal. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. I just Go wanted on. to follow up and agree with Jeff and thank everyone for the uh, hard work that they did to open up. The operation was uh, pretty pretty smooth, and whatever bumps are in the road, I'm sure that we'll address mm -hmm. and uh, do our best to make it a good experience. I just have one question about the away games. So you describe our scenario. When our athletes go to Shore Regional, uh, are they following the same protocol that we are? And so those parents would ride the bus or go there themselves, not ride the bus, but attend yes, we're themselves. We're definitely not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it very clear the parents will not parents be riding, not the bus. riding the bus. Uh, but are, would they be allowed? Then to go to that's going to be up to each individual district and how they're handling that. Uh, our, our, I can tell you what, what we're doing is we're basically allowing up to 100 away visitors, okay. which 
we think is fair to, to be able, you know, when we mapped it out for graduation, we, we knew that we could fit people in a, in a socially distanced way in the, in the visitor's bleachers at about 125. And so we think about 100 people, which theoretically leaves 400 people for, for our side. You know, what, what we're trying to determine right now is, you know, what's the maximum number of people that we can put on, you know, the home side in a, in a um, socially distanced, you know, safe and healthy way. Um, and, you know, we know that number is at least 250 because we know graduation, that's what we did, but we're gonna try to maximize that and get as many, because, you know, you can have people standing and things like that, mm -hmm. but, you know, we wanna, we wanna be safe. You know, what we don't wanna do is create a situation where, you know, we let so many people in and people are clamped together and then the next thing you know, oh, you know, somebody tested positive and now we gotta shut our athletics down, you know? So, so if we have to sacrifice a few spectators to keep our programs going, we think that's probably the, the better thing to do. But we want it, we do want to make sure at the very least that the families and uh, the kids playing and, and you know, um, the, the cheerleaders and the band can, can, can see their kids play and perform. That was one, of, one other question. So you said the players, so players, cheerleaders, and band don't- It's my understanding, anyone who's on the field, coaches, you know, right. don't count toward the 500. That's my understanding. So, for example, the band won't be in the in the They're not gonna be in the, in the bleachers. Yeah. More than likely, you know, maybe you know, and, and our band won't go to away games. Oh, they won't. They will not. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, the whole thing is not ideal. But, well, no, I know. Um, now, look, you know, we're still tweaking some of these things, so you know, I, I can give you a better idea next week. But, but these, you know, it, it is going to be different. It's not going to be a normal Friday night Friday night lights, you know, kind of situation. So, okay. just so we know. Thank you. And, and we're, you know, just want to run. We're, we're, you know, a lot of districts have canceled athletics, you know, so we're, we're moving forward and we're, and we're, we're doing it. So we, we want to, we want to, we want to give these kids a season. The spring was terrible, not to have those, not to have any of those kids have a season that they lost their season, and we don't want that to happen for, for these kids as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Janner. Hello. Hello. Uh, I am just going to piggyback on what's been said already. And just to add to it a little bit more, I agree with everything 100% as far as the staff and the, the students and the parents, everything <clears throat> has been great. But I just want to focus a little bit on some of the people that, that I see their hard work, you know, every day, uh, which is the, the maintenance, the grounds, the custodial, um, especially transportation, you know, and uh, tech, technology, where a lot of these guys have been working literally overtime. Saturdays every day, gals. Thank you. Usually, Janice corrects me on that, but uh, and it's a lot of work. The scale, the effort that goes into it is truly commendable, and they've done an, an amazing job. You know, we spend years creating procedures and and things, and then within a few months, it's all up in the air, and then a couple of weeks in, it's changes, and then changes again so really trying to to handle all that especially transportation and we have people coming every day now now wanting transportation who didn't want transportation and and now we have routes for you know students with different last names and this is all unprecedented as we've said and and just to to understand a lot of that i know the board does and i want to make sure the public understands it, it's not easy and you're right i think irene said the bumps in the road literally transportation wise, but you know, all over the place. And there've been some problems, there certainly have. And, but they've worked, uh, you know, from help desk to everyone, uh, has really been working hard to try to correct everything we can. And, and it's gotten better from the first day to the next day and will continue to get better. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who's been working on that. And the nurses, I would say too. Nurses, the nurses uh, are doing, <laughs> they've seen them outside. That's I've true, uh, absolutely. Security um, too, security. I, I'm sure I forgot some some people, but uh, everyone has done. I learned, I learned that my temperature runs cold. <laughs> I've, I've, I've taken it four thousand times in the last. I think every wrist you know uh, unit we have, I'm running around a cold ninety six and a half. Oh, there you days. go. Yeah, yeah. In case anyone's wondering. <laughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. website at this point in the meeting we will now conduct the first of two public comment sessions the first session will be open for public comments on agenda items only 
The second session will be at the end of the meeting and can be on any topic. Would anyone from the public like to comment on any agenda item at this time? Mr. Dietrich. Please remember, sorry, I forgot to say, if you have a comment that you would like to make, please message in the chat to Mr. Dietrich, and he will call on you in the order in which he received the request. Right now, Amy, I only have one, and it's really based on something Jim said, so I'm assuming we'll include that as agenda? Sure. Okay. Erica McCann, you can go ahead and come off mute. Okay. So really, when you guys were talking about the band and the football field, you were saying they weren't going to be in the stands. Where are they going to be? I think they're working, and Erica, don't quote me, because I think we're still working on it, but I think the idea is going to be maybe toward the end of one of the end zone areas, like behind the end zones. Okay. While the kids are playing. I mean, obviously, they still have an opportunity to go out onto the field at halftime, but that's my understanding. But I think it's still being worked on, so it's not set in stone at this point. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Alex Hayes. Sorry, I thought you were muted. There you are. Yep. There we are. Mr. Guy, I brought up the back to school. I'm just wondering, did any non-Puerto Rican school elves just, is anyone on the second half of the alphabet? Alex, we're getting a ton of feedback on you. I don't know if you have more than one. Wait, it changed when you scooted that over, so go ahead. I think you said, I think your question is, do we have any A to L kids? Do we have any M to Z show up? Is that your question? Yes. Okay. I think, I think I heard one child at Wayside may have come. I, 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 that's, I'm not sure. If Denise is on. She is. Can you, no? Didn't happen? Wasn't you? I dreamt it? Okay. I thought, I thought one of you guys told me that, that somebody M through, or L through Z showed up. There was one student, but maybe I am mistaken. So, not to our knowledge, Alex. You have a, go ahead. I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry, it's my laptop. Can you go over the holding room of, if there is, you know, a kid with a temperature in the morning, where that holding room is, where is the kid's wallet? Does that holding room have one door, an exit? This would, yeah, Alex, this would be, that would be an end of the meeting in question, but we can go over it at the end of the meeting. Oh, I thought you were talking about first two weeks of school. And going back, but okay. We'll come, we'll circle back to that at the end. Are there any other agenda questions at this time? No? Okay. All right, moving on to action items. Approval of minutes. Dr. Marshall. Thank you, Ms. McGovern. I move to approve the meeting minutes in accordance with Board of Education bylaws regarding the, regarding the work meeting and executive session minutes of September 8th, 2020. Can I have a second, please? I'll second. Any comments, corrections on the September 8th, 2020 work or executive session minutes? Hearing none, Ken? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marshall. Moving on to financial management, Ms. Gilman. Thank you, Ms. McGovern. We have one item for this evening. The Board of Education and Administration will discuss the agreement with Monmouth County Vocational School District, MSVSD, to accept Township of Ocean students into the following programs for the 2020-2021 school year as listed below. Ken, did you see if we can get a discount because they're all virtual right now? It's a good idea. I'll have to check on that. It's a thought. Not a good idea. Mr. Janero, any comments? I mean, this is our annual approval of students that are going to the vocational schools. Nothing out of the ordinary. Are they remote? Do we know if any of these are working remotely? They are remote. I don't know if Jim may know for how long, 
but the, the vocational is still going remote until? Uh, I want to say it's maybe the first week in October. Yeah, something at like least. that. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there. There's so many different districts with different dates. I, uh, you know, yeah. I want to say October 5th is what's ringing in my head right now. They definitely started all remote. They, they started. They definitely started all remote. Yes. So we would date that they're going back to a hybrid. October 5th is the target date. Yeah, for a hybrid. And there so are different hybrid. Does the cost per student include busing? If we're not busing them? We pay, we pay for the busing. Right. So, okay. right. so the cost, this would just be tuition cost. That's tuition. Right, so our, our so right now our bus drivers that are have vocational runs, we have uh, you know assign them to do something else right now. Thank you. Okay. Can I? Yeah, I was okay. joking. They're still paying their teachers. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a, a second on the motion then. Well, I think that's discussion, discussion right? Discussion. Yeah. So that'll be on for next week for formal Thanks. approval. Thank you, Ms. McGovern. I have uh, two discussion items and two presentations this evening as part of the Instructing Education Student Activities Report. Um, item one will be a discussion of the requests of parents of four students to allow their children to finish their senior year at the Ocean Township High School. Uh, these requests have uh, come from parents who've moved out of the district and uh, are in line with District Policy Number 5111. Um, item two will be a presentation by Ms. Keller Wellen on the placement program results, uh, assessment results for the school year. Item three, a new presentation uh, by Ms. Zonda, our Assistant Superintendent of Special Services on the Electoral uh, Wellness Committee. And then finally, item four, the Board and Administration will discuss the New Jersey Department of Education School Assessment, Self-Assessment for Determining HIV Grades under the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act uh, for the period of July 1st. June 30th, um, attached are copies of all five reports from each of our individual schools. Um, I don't anticipate these discussion items generating too much discussion, so maybe we'll get those out of the way before the presentations, if that's okay with... Um... Sounds good. Really? You don't really anticipate that? <laughs> yeah, I think experience. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's on... Talk about those hit grades. We tend to have some discussion sometimes. So, um, well, the first, the first, as, as um, Dr. Marshall said, a uh, first item um, was discussed in, in uh, detail in executive session. But as you said, our board policy does allow for uh, students uh, in their senior year if they move out of district in during their senior year, the summer preceding their senior year, to be able to finish. Um, you know, finish their, their careers here uh, in the district. And that's something the board has graciously uh, allowed to, uh, folks to do as for policy. And um, so we'll discuss that. Okay, uh, number four, this is uh, annually each, uh, each school within the district does a self-assessment uh, based on um, uh, a number of different uh, core elements related to uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. It doesn't really have to do with the number of cases you have. It's more about how you train and how you prepare and how you conduct the operations of it. Um, and so um, it's each uh, area is graded on a scale of zero to three, with three being above the minimum requirement, two representing the minimum requirement. So if you do what you're supposed to do, you give yourself a two. If you go beyond what you're supposed to do, you would give yourself a three. Of course, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, it's a zero or a one. So a lot of times, so each, each one is, is out of its possible 78 points. Um, so for example, at the high school, you know, they have a 63. Um, that doesn't mean they're not doing a good job. That means they're, they're, they're doing most of what they're supposed to do, and in some cases, beyond what they're supposed to do. Uh, because if I'm not mistaken, um, I think a 54 is the minimum score that you would give yourself if you, you get a two in each area. So I'm happy to say that each of our districts is part of our, excuse me, each of our, our schools is part of their self-assessment. And this self-assessment is done by their school teams. Their, each school has a, um, 
you know, like the climate and cult, you know, uh, climate and culture team committee, um, and and that's who performs the self self assessment. It's not one individual that does it. Um, and I think uh, you know, as you can see, our schools, you know, um, you know, I think assess themselves uh, pretty well. You know, the high school with a 63, uh, 65 for the intermediate school. Ocean Township Elementary School is 69, uh, Masa, um, uh 71, or excuse me, 70, and Wayside, Wayside, you know, bringing in, bringing in the top uh, mark with a 72. So, um, happy to answer any questions on that. You know, Kelly also is the district um, HIB um, coordinator, could, could also answer any questions that any board members have regarding the uh, self-assessment. Jim, what happens if you do fall below that score? That 54. What is the protocol for that? I don't know that anyone ever put themselves below 54. Well, um, I, I, there's, uh, and, and Kelly, you might be able to answer this better than I. I think there's, there's a, there's like a. Two stack. For one, you would probably lose points in two stack. And then you would have to probably write uh, yeah, an action plan, plan to yeah. improve. Right. You have to the action plan will provide. Right. Okay. Right. Like I said, I, I don't know that we've seen that. So. Sure we have okay. I don't know how many schools have seen that, quite honestly. But. Yes, sir. So on some of these where there are because it's both it's all twos and threes. Mm -hmm. So on some of these, are you is there any level of surprise that there are two and not three? Well, for, I think, uh, no, I mean, actually, let me just, let me just finish. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. So on some, like, when there's notification to parents of alleged offenders and alleged victims in each, in each reported case. Can we talk like, about it? Just, I just want to make sure I get Sure. Like, uh, notification to parents of alleged offenders and alleged victims in each reported hit incident, right? So when I look at that, I'm thinking, that seems like a very binary thing. You either do it consistently or you don't. Right, so, so I would think if you do it consistently, and you're, that should be constantly be a three, right? Otherwise, otherwise, yeah. Or, or, or the team may look at it is it that if we do what we're supposed to do, then we're doing what the minimum requirement is. You know, it, it might depend on how that how the team looks at it. Right. Well, I'm looking at it that if you had a two, you probably you, there are some instances where you did not tell the parents. That's no. why I was doing it. I would no. Two means you do what you're supposed to do. So, for example, like there's X number of meetings that you're supposed to have in a year, mm -hmm. right? I think you're supposed to have two meetings. Right. Right. So, if you have your two meetings, that would be a two because you have your two meetings. Some people have more than two meetings. Some or some schools, some some teams have more than two meetings. So, if you have more than two meetings, they might give themselves a three. You know, last year not being in school from March 13th on, you know, definitely impacted some yeah. some of this. A lot of this, though, a lot of the training and things get done at the beginning of the year, obviously, because. You know, we want to make sure that everybody's aware uh, of what's going on at the beginning of the year. You know, to start doing assemblies for kids in April on bullying is not necessarily the most timely thing to do, right? You want to do those things at the beginning of school years. So, I guess my question goes to when you looked at this and you looked at those reports, were there areas that you said, I'd like us to have threes in and not settle for twos? Were there areas that you felt like that that was important? Um, that's what I, that's what I was more interested in knowing. Well, I don't know. Last year, one week, somebody had a perfect score, and and there was discussion about how could you have a perfect score. Perfect. So so uh, you know I, I don't know. I think that we walk a you know a fine line sometimes. You know I, I think it's up to the individual school teams. I mean they they know the things that they're doing, and, and they I think their job is to assess what they're doing well, and to uh, that's the point of the self assessment. To be honest, you, you decide what is working well, what isn't working well, where can you know where can they improve? Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, I think the fact that we were not in for you know three months, three four months out of the school year made it made it a little more difficult to do some of the things that, that they might want to do. But you know, in looking at these numbers, I I, I, I feel the schools of because I will say, you know, I, I actually Jeff go the other way where when when there's a really high score, I kind of sit there and go, you know. Did, did we? Did, were we? So too the, where so were we? Too kind. So I guess you know, last year's discussion was valuable. I, I think I hope so. <laughs> um, no, I mean I, I, I think it's important to be honest and, and, and to and to you know assess uh, accurately. And you know I certainly leave it. I, I have complete faith in the in, in the school teams to be able to do that. 
So I, I, I believe, and that's not to say that last year's scores weren't accurate for that year. This is a yearly assessment. So, you know, what could have been a 78 last year could very easily be a 68 this year. It's just, it's, it's how it works. Yeah. Okay. I have two questions. It's great down The specialist is a school-based position, and the district coordinator is, is just that. They oversee the, the district, um, you know, the district operations. They meet and coordinate between the buildings, make sure things are done in a uniform manner, those kinds of things. And, and my second question is, is there a checks and balances in place for the reporting procedure for one of the, um, In terms of investigation? Yeah, so if there is um, a report or an allegation that this could be a HIP issue, um, how is that process? What happens? Right, well, when, when, there, when there's a, when, when an allegation or a parent or a student or anyone brings it to the attention, usually of, of the, you know, building administration, um, that's usually the first, you know, group that gets it. Um, they, the, 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 the building administrator would then, you know, contact the specialist. Uh, in some cases, as we know, in our district, those people have been the same. Um, but they would they would bring the team together. Uh, that person would often involve, the, the, you know, that group, that team would involve the guidance counselor, would involve, you know, a variety of people within the school to conduct investigation. Um, there's notifications that go out that, not that investigations are taking place. Um, you know, and, and there's timelines that have to be that have to be followed. That checks and balance are the district coordinator, and then ultimately um, myself. Thank you. And then, of course, the board of education affirms all all HIP investigations. The principal, and within our policy too, Grace Ann, the principal of the school does have the authority to look at a. Uh, a, a situation to make a quick determination of whether they feel it, it could, if, if it's a clear-cut conflict, uh, not meeting the criteria uh, under the law for what would be an HIV, then they have the ability to make that call without going through a full investigation. We say to our, our you know, principals that if there's any doubt at all, you should do the investigation and go through that process. Yeah, we, we, we need to let them know what, what the outcome of the investigation is. And that, that even if it's not HIP, that goes to the Board of Education for affirmation as well. Okay. Any other questions on either of those two policies or those two items? So I think we'll move to Ms. Weldon first, right? Yeah, so um, this summer we, we got uh, our AP scores. And just, you know, as a reminder, the AP uh, tests were a little bit different this, this past year as that they were all online uh, because of the uh, pandemic. And um, uh, so, so a little bit different. The, uh, you know, the, the tests were, were um, I think, a little shorter than they normally are, um, you know, and, and following a, sort of a different format. but. Um, um, we were we were overall very pleased with with our, our, our test results this year. Um, AP, I give you know the AP teachers a ton of credit for keeping the kids engaged and keeping them uh, you know in in, uh, in line so that they could uh, follow through and, and take their tests. And also just a reminder that we require the AP exam uh, if you're enrolled in the class for the vast majority of AQ. You know we we've had a couple classes where we do allow some kids to kind of choose if they take it, but oh, even in those classes, the, the vast majority of the kids do take the exam. We do pay for it and we require it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an indicator of, of how well, how we're doing. So, you know, over the years, I know we've talked a lot about the value in that and, you know, is that, is that the right thing to do? And, and at this point, we still believe that it is. Um, but, you know, sometimes when everyone takes a test, that results in sometimes an overall lower average score or fewer kids getting fours and fives because everyone's taking it. Where in other districts, 
Um, a lot of kids who only know they're going to get threes, fours, and fives take the test, you know, and they're paying for it. So uh, we're very pleased with our performance this year, and I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Kelly to give you the specifics. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, if I may just ahead of my presentation, also just acknowledge that it is National IT Professional Day, and I um, echo what Ken said just to you know, provide as much praise as possible for our IT team and all they've done. Um, it's not a perfect, it's not, a per it's not perfect at this point, but I, I certainly know that they've given um, tireless, tireless hours to all of us to get us up and running. And since it is National IT Professionals Day, I did just want to note that and thank them for all that they do. Okay, so ordinarily in the fall of every year, I give a much larger assessment presentation, but just to remind everyone, because the, the New Jersey student learning assessments were canceled in the spring of last year, um, in the spring I did present any assessment results we had from the fall of 2019. So um, that included everything we had up to that point. At that point, we did not have our AP results, but now we do, so that's what you see here in front of you. Mr. Dietrich, if you could advance this for me, that'd be great. Okay, um, I think one, one, one more slide above that. Yeah, so last May, as Dr. Spankwood said, the test looked very different. Students took the test remotely. They took it at home. There were, there were very specific parameters for students to follow while they were taking the test. College Board themselves had a number of technology difficulties which did cause some students to be kicked out with really no other recourse but to sit for the test again during a makeup session. So um, certainly some frustrations out there, but I credit our students for really um, sticking with it and doing their absolute best. The performance was strong this past spring. We had 283 students take 495 exams in 21 different subject areas, and the breakdown of grade levels are there for you, uh, just showing you that we do have students at every grade level in the high school taking, taking an AP course and an AP exam. Thank you, you can advance this one. Okay, AP scores range from one to five, five being the highest. In the eyes of most colleges, a score of a three is considered a passing score or a score that will be considered for earning college credit, three or higher. So that's why we give you that breakout here. You see that 11% of our exam scores were a perfect five, 34% of them were a four or a five, and 65% of our exam scores were a three, four, or five. Thank you. And then this is just a breakdown on the different subjects. And this gives you a three-year pattern here just to see some trends. And if you look at the, the bottom row of each table here, you have the mean score. You have the number of exams taken. So a number, the number of students who sat for biology last year was 26 students, earning a mean score of 2.6 to 0, slightly higher than the year before. So you're really just looking down that mean score column to see the trends. And maybe you want to look at the exam score column as well just to see how many students sat for the exam. And um, I have in this presentation, which is on Board Docs and will be on the website, each, each subject area. So if you could advance, you'll see here we have our English, environmental science, some of our social studies courses, Italian, same process. Same chart, giving you that same information. And we're happy to say that in most of our courses, in the majority of our courses, this year's mean score was above last year's mean score. Um, I think that credit goes to the teachers and the students, and of course, the different format of the test, um, I'm sure, impacted that as well. And those are the last three subject scores that you see. So those are our AP scores for this past May 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And you know, one other thing I, I, I want to mention too is that um, for many, I think that you know, in the in the history of, of, of AP, uh, get, trying to get into an AP course for, for a lot of kids was was like trying to get into uh, you know Fort Knox that you had to have um, you know a 99 or above and stand on your head and you know be able to juggle and what have you, but but. Uh, over you know the last so many years, um, probably probably the last ten years, 
uh, and certainly, you know, more um, in earnest, you know, uh, as of late, we've really worked to um, uh, allow more open access into our AP classes to where if a student wants to take the course, they can. And, and um, any student, I think at this point, and Mrs. Kasuga, correct me if I'm wrong if you're out there, um, any student who wishes to take an AP course and challenge themselves can do so. Is that is that accurate, Mrs. Kasuga? <coughs> Kelly's, Kelly's not yeah, in the Yeah, I was saying okay. that that's well, we'll go to Kelly. We'll go to Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. There she is. <laughs> yes, I would, I would say that's accurate as well. I'm sorry, I had a, a visitor. Um, yes, we, we definitely do our best to get as many kids in who have an interest in it. They do go through a waiver process if they haven't been recommended, but pretty much without exception, uh, unless there's a, a very serious concern um, based on certain performance, they, they get into those classes. And, and Dawn, correct me, but in, in your analysis of those kids who, uh, you know, signed that waiver because they didn't necessarily meet all the criteria, those kids tend to perform very well in those courses. Is that is that accurate? So there, so when we've been tracking that over the last couple of years, their performance is consistent with what our like the percentage, the percentage of those students and their average AP score has been consistent with the average AP score of the rest of the students taking the test. So for example, um, I haven't crunched these numbers yet other than to look at them and, and reach out to the teachers and congratulate them. But when I do put these ones in, I'm sure it will be similar to last year's where I think the student average maybe was a 2.7 for most students, and I think our average of our, our, our kids who were not typically in those classes was a 2.68, so very, very close. You know, which I think speaks to allowing kids the opportunity if they're motivated and they want to, they want to challenge themselves that they, that they uh, usually do well. They usually do very well in, in those situations. So, so it's, a, it's a great practice and, and having that open access and um, you know, that helps, that helps the entire school community uh, across. It, it helps to raise the levels of expectation across the board for all students, and, that, and that's something that's really important to do. So I commend, you know, I commend our teachers. They did a great job. I commend our kids and, um, you know, the, the uh, supervisors and everyone who, you know, who work to, to, to see these outcomes. Normally, just to, to give everybody an idea, and Kelly correct me, but usually it's about 50% threes, fours, and fives. If I, if I go back, if you go back historically. Last year it was 52%, right. three, fours, and fives. Right, and this year it was around 65. So, you know, and once again, as you said, it might be a little bit have to do with, with the nature of the test this past year, but, but even so, I think that's an outstanding, um, um, you know, it shows outstanding growth from our kids, so it's good stuff. Okay, if I say one more thing. Sure. No. <laughs> so I think absolutely the um, format of the test was different and that had an impact, but also our, our teachers prepared them for that. They were using the AP site in order to give them practice tests from that site in the new format. And in addition to that, if you look at our scores um, versus the state and national averages, in many areas, being scored consistently across the board, our students did better in many of those areas. Not in all of them, but in many. So, it, so to me, that says that even based on the state standard and the national standard of performance, whether the test was this format or any other format, our, our kids did better. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, just, just when you had one terrific presentation, it's time for another. All Thank right. You, um, Moving on to, go ahead. Yeah. So next up, um, Zona is going to uh, give us an update. Uh, she and um, Anthony Di Pasquale, our uh, director of school counseling, have been chairing <coughs> our, our uh, district uh, wellness committee, uh, preparing for the beginning of school and, and how to address the social emotional needs of our kids, which we all know has been very important as they return for the. For, you know, in six months, first time being here in six months, and, and with the anxieties, not just our students, but our staff as well. Uh, so I think Jen's going to share with us some of the work of the committee and show you some of the things that went on in the beginning of the school year to help uh, our kids um, and staff uh, address their emotional needs as we started school. So, Jen? 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to talk about our district's SEL. <coughs> Every year on the first day of school, I've witnessed educators lead an icebreaker activity for their students, and I've seen teachers give their students a slip of paper and ask them to write something about themselves. It can be something that they love, something that they hope for, anything that would describe their identity. And then the teacher staples each of those slips as links to make a chain. And that chain gets hung up in the classroom as a decoration, sure, but also as a reminder that everyone in that class, including the teacher, are all connected, that they're all linked. But what happens when one of those links feel weak? And what happens when the weakness is not just a student or two, but maybe it's also the, the person that was holding the stapler, the teacher. Historically, it's been the assumption that the teacher was the one person who was charged with making those connections, but what happens now? As educators, we work every day to provide support socially, emotionally, and academically to our students. Our students come with diverse needs and past experiences. However, this year is unlike any other year, as you know. Our students, faculty, and community are coming to us with significant trauma that they've experienced over the last seven months from when this pandemic started. Every single one of us has been affected in some way or another. And that's the hard part about being in education. It isn't really the teaching, you know, the grading, the meetings, all the paperwork, what have you. Even though that's what occupies most of our time and energy, the tough part of education is all about the things that we can't control all the things that we can't change for our students once they walk away from our school buildings. So this summer, every school district was grappling with the unprecedented set of circumstances we had to work through to open up our schools and welcome students and adults back. However, it also offered us an opportunity to pause and think about how we should bring together educators, students, families, to co-create in these transformative, transformative learning experiences. We all play, every single one of us, an enormous role in shaping the relationships, environments, and experience that foster social, emotional, and academic development. And tonight, Anthony and I will review the critically important work that has been done <coughs> and what lies ahead. Jim, do you wanna flip for me? Thanks. So this is our district wellness committee. Um, we are comprised of board members, community members, parents, administration, and this work is not possible to do on our own. Each SEL team member contributed in a meaningful way. However, when we started this, not everyone knew who everyone was on the committee, and it was important for us to get to know each other and to connect and create an inclusive team. So each meeting, just to give you guys a sidebar, each meeting we uh, practice in an SEL uh, activity to kind of do the work that we were expecting our staff to do. And it was great to put that into practice right away. And at times there was the uh, diverse perspectives and it contributed to a lot of meaningful collaboration. And as we all know, this year is full of complex problems and uncertainty. And the committee, whose most of those members were volunteering their time, committed to each to meet weekly to create this implementation plan. And from there, um, the building levels committees were formed and then pushed out into the schools. And Anthony, do you wanna talk a little bit about the building level teams? Sure, definitely want to, uh, to bring that up at the end. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the district level teams. Each building level team has <clears throat> school counselors, our SAC students, which are very important. We have a few students uh, that, that volunteer their time as well as teachers uh, and administration on our building level teams. And our building level teams will act as liaisons between the district level teams and you know our needs within the buildings. Great, thank you. Jim, next slide. Okay, so this is our 2020-21 uh, year school year work. Um, the district chose to use the CASIO Unite, Renew and Thrive SEL Roadmap for Reopening Schools as our guide for implementing the SEL into our daily practice. Uh, the SEL roadmap is designed to support school leaders and leadership teams in planning for the tra tra transition back to schools in whatever form that takes. And from there, we took a critical practice for each week and we started to break down the components and lay out the work that needed to be done. 
and there are we are in a few different stages with each of these items. So we certainly have worked through a lot of this. There's still more work to be done. Some of the um, more hard physical evidence would be the surveys um, and the resource maps and the um, we did cultivate a, an online library of SEL activity as well. So I wanted and the need to talk a little bit more about the surveys and the information that we were looking to gather from them. So a little bit more about the surveys. So the district committee pushed out a staff survey on <clears throat> August 20th to all staff members in all five buildings. We had about 200 responses, which was really great for a summer survey. <clears throat> we asked specific questions such as, how concerned are you about your physical well-being? How concerned are you about your social emotional well-being? What is your comfort level returning to school? What is your biggest barrier entering the school year? What supports are needed for you to feel comfortable teaching? <clears throat> we also asked um, if anyone would be interested in referrals for counseling services, group mindfulness activities, uh, meditation, team building act activities, support groups, and or additional SEL trainings. We then took those results as a committee, reviewed them as a group, and were able to tailor our beginning of the year PD sessions as well as our new staff PD session, which was held in late August. Um, our next step is to push out a student survey, which we'll be doing probably within the next week or two. And we decided to hold off a little bit on those surveys just to give the kids a little bit of time to acclimate themselves back to the building to see what it's going to look like once they get into their, their buildings. So look for that in about a week or two.
school-wide SEL is a systematic approach to infusing social and emotional learning into every part of students' educational experience. In every classroom, during all parts of the school day, and out of school time, and in partnerships with families and communities. This approach provides a learning environment that integrates SEL into all aspects of instruction for all our students. Just, just wanted to add to that, Jen. Um, yeah. You know, going back to that slide, this, this is something that we've been preaching to our staff, to our new, our new staff especially. This is not just a teacher's, uh, you know, initiative. This is not just a counselor initiative. It's not just, um, you know, a family initiative. This is a collaborative initiative that we really have to tackle head on with, you know, with our building level teams, our communities, um, in collaboration with our families. So I think it's very important to mention that this is not just like one person. Um, you know, issue. Yes, it takes the village, so to say. Um, so there's four identified focus areas of implementation. The process for implementation is not linear and or one size fits all. It's critically important that all schools begin with a strong foundation and a plan for SEL, which was what we started working on this summer. And while students are at the core of everything we do, the research also states that SEL implementation depends on adults who have strong emotional abilities and are skilled at promoting students' SEL. So therefore, there was an importance on our schools engaging in these strategies that support both adult and student <coughs> SEL. And that was a lot of discussion that we had this summer that you know, it wasn't just our students that had experienced trauma, it was our staff as well. And to support them and their return so that they can in turn support our students. So what does SEL look like in the classroom? There's three factors. It's a supportive classroom environment. It's explicit SEL instruction. And then there's also an integration of SEL into everyday instruction. The following slides, there's a number of them, are just examples of the SEL that has been implemented in the last few weeks um, since we started back in integrating schools back into our, uh, and adults back into the building. So um, Anthony, you could probably tell us which school, or maybe not, but I think you can. Um, yeah, we, we go through them, I can tell you which school they're from. So, so this right here is from Dow Avenue. As you can see, it's Mrs. Whalen's, um, her door. We're looking to, to kind of showcase some of the SEL initiatives in each building um, to make it more of like a daily um, occurrence, to make it more so our students become more familiar with the language and they see it in the hallways and they start to practice more SEL every day. So this is Dow Avenue. This here is uh, the display case at the high school. So as soon as you walk into high school, so this is one of the first things that our students see, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's our display case dedicated uh, directly to social emotional learning. This is my favorite one. So this is um, so our teacher mailbox is at the high school, and our staff at the high school, Jenna Kabatis, wrote handwritten notes to every staff member the night before the first day of school. So as the teachers came in to sign in or scan in, um, on day one, they they found this in their mailbox, and I was there for for you know when the teachers came in on the first day, and it really it really made a difference. Um, there were smiles, there were more more laughter. It was it kind of took that anxiety and, and you know pushed it aside. So it was a really cool gesture, really good idea by by John and our staff. And uh, this, as you can see, another note from uh, one of our counselors at Wayside, Kristen McHugh. Um, she handed this note to all of her, her staff members as well. Uh, just some posters in our elementary schools uh, discussing growth mindset, you know, changing the way they think, um, setting goals. So we have this pretty much, I think that they're in all three elementary schools now. So one of our activities that Mrs. Whalen does with her students, pretty cool activity, um, to make a list of five things you are thankful for each day um, to get them, the, the students and, and even staff to think a little bit more positive. Another wayside bulletin board with kindness and some 
encounter it. Here are some more kindness posters that were put up at Dye Avenue on the lockers of our students so they can see them while they're in the hallways. And this is great. This is from Tammy Garrett, a teacher at Wayside. She does this with her students every day. She does a morning check-in and an end-of-day check-in using Google Forms. And this is a great way to see, you know, to get a gauge of how her students are feeling when they come into the building and how they're feeling when they leave for the day. So that was just the beginning steps. There's a lot of work to be ahead of, ahead of us. So we want to continue to grow with the staff's knowledge and capacity to help students with SEL. We want to continue to partner with our families and community members to improve experiences and outcomes. And we also would like to develop a data system to measure and track the progress of SEL. That way we can identify students that are in need of additional resources. We hope that everyone has a deeper understanding of what SEL is and the importance of establishing this practice to leverage this historical moment that we were in in such a positive way, which isn't always the focus. So now more than ever, we will need to take care of ourselves and our colleagues, strengthen our partnerships, pool our resources, develop common goals, and identify opportunities to work together to support all members of our school community so we can sustain the work over time. Um, and on behalf of the Board of Education Administration, uh, Anthony and I really wanna thank the staff and the families and the community members who have worked so hard on developing this plan and everyone's commitment to SEL in the district. Anthony, I know that you have a specific. Sure, yeah, just Jenna, I just really wanted to take a minute to acknowledge um, and thank the members of our district wellness committee for all of our help and their efforts and volunteering their time during this crazy summer. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to mention um, our members. So our board of, board of ed members, Mr. Weinstein and Mrs. Talrigo, our OTHS SAC, Jenna Cavadas, our TOIS SAC, Lena Jaramillo, our school counselors, Doreen Brown, Kristen McHugh, James Donningham, and Samantha Whalen. Members of our CSP, we have Rachel Gerstein, Angela Rahib, Melissa Brandonetti, Catherine Brown, Karen Dunn, Bridget Burns, and Jennifer Barris, and our parents and community members, um, a big thank you to them, Amanda Smythe, Kristen Brophy, Emily Wood, Lori Todd, and the Director of Human Services, Sharon Bosk. We want to thank you guys for all of your help this summer, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with you and take this SEO initiative to uh, a whole other level. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, guys. You're doing, nice. doing great work. Um, and you know, this, we know how important this is because kids, as we said many times, if kids aren't, able, if kids aren't in a place socially and emotionally to learn, they're not gonna be able to address um, anything academically. So, so <coughs> we appreciate not just your work, but the work that the counselors and the teachers have done now that we've returned. To, uh, to to help our kids, you know, come back and and also too, you know, this was it's been very there's been a lot of trauma for staff as well, you know, so taking care of their needs and, and you've, you've worked to do that as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to Jen and Anthony for uh, for driving this and keeping it on pace and you know every every week at uh, eleven o'clock and uh, on a Tuesday it was tough to keep it going, but uh, got everybody there and. Did some great stuff, put a lot of things together, and um, very well done. Very, really good attention to detail on the discussions, too, so very nice and fun. Uh, Grace, I just wanted to, go ahead. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Zona and Mr. DePasquale and all the members of the Wellness Committee. I mean, I am really proud to be on this committee. A lot of good, important work has been done, and you know, I'm so happy that this committee was started and you know implementing through the district. So thank you to everyone. It's been a wonderful experience for me. Great. Yeah, well, thank you, Grace. And you were ahead of the governor um, in in getting this committee started. So you know, <laughs> I appreciate you bringing it to us. It's a great committee that we added um, as a board, and I appreciate you 
you know, you and, and Jen and Anthony with no roadmap, really, of actually making this, you know, a committee of substance where we're seeing stuff already take place and happen. So that's great, and, and I appreciate it. I know Ms. Gilman, I think, wanted to say something. I, I do have a, a question for Jen or Grace Ann or, or Anthony. So you took an initial staff survey, and that helped to drive uh, the PD for the opening days. But now we're rolling, and staff members are experiencing some of the same anxieties and stress. Maybe some of it has been alleviated by coming into the building. But do you plan to do a, another survey soon to uh, see how our staff members are doing and how we might uh, address the current issues that have come up since that initial survey? Definitely, we absolutely have to. I mean, at this point, it's really about gathering the data um, to see what our next steps are. So, you know, without a doubt, staff surveys are going to continue. As I mentioned, the student surveys because we really need to figure out what their needs are. And we even talked a little bit about family surveys to see what's going on in, in their home. So, yeah, that, that's definitely going to continue. Well, and if I may, I, I think, you know, that any surveys that we do I, are going to be a combination of both you know, from an SEL perspective, but also an academic perspective as well. What, what, are the, how, what you know, what, what, are, what do the teachers need? What are they, you know, what's not going, what's going well, what's not going well? Similar to what we did in the spring, mm -hmm. both with families as well. You know, but we, we want to get, we want to get in, you know, a little bit. Let's get a couple of weeks go by, and so we can. It's hard to base anything off of two days, you know. So yeah. let's get in, do a couple of weeks, and then we can, we can assess, you know, the community as a whole as to, you know, how, how our staff feels, how our kids feel, how our our parents feel and then you know we'll go from there. And Jen, how often um, going forward, how often will the wellness committee meet? We, we met every week over the summer because we really wanted to have a solid plan for the opening. Right. Um, and then at the last meeting, the staff felt that they needed to kind of come into the buildings, get the feel of, you know, the vibe energy from everyone. Um, there is going to be an email going out this week to talk, you know, get the consensus of when our next meeting should be. I would think, you know, right now we're still in that, you know, stage where we're really building this ship. Mm -hmm. It'll be meeting more frequently um, to kind of collaborate together. And then as time goes on, it would, you know, it wouldn't be as, awesome. you know, every week every month but you know okay. continuing to, this is to me uh, you know there is no finish line here we would continue to just okay. there's always going to be a need so um i don't have a frequency as when the meetings would be but i would see the future the immediate future would be more often than not okay thank you sure any other questions from the board or comments no okay thank you dr marshall um, we're going to move on to personnel. Ms. Perlamas. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to make a motion to table item 10.6. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, so we'll do a roll call on <coughs> tabling 10.6. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mrs. Fuller? Yes. Mrs. Gilman? Yes. Mr. Hodden? Yes. Dr. Marshall? Mrs. Parlamas? Yes. Ms. Tallarico? She said yes. You said yes, right? Yes. Yes, yes I heard it. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. And Ms. McGovern? Yes. Okay, the motion is tabled, 10.6. Okay. And then I would like to make a motion to move items 10.1 through 10.5 and 10.7. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Janow? Okay, Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mrs. Fuller? Yes. Mrs. Gilman? Yes. Mr. Hyde? Yes. Dr. Marshall? Yes. Mrs. Parlamas? Yes. Mrs. Tallarico? Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. And Mr. McGovern? Yes. Okay, the motion's carried. Uh, real quick, if I, if I may, I, I'm not sure, I know we, we just approved a couple of new staff members tonight, and I'm not sure if, if Julie's on, but I did see Carl Lawson on. <laughs> Uh, and Julie's here too. Great. But welcome to both Julie uh, Lessing and Carl. Uh, great to have you both. Um, and, and sorry, Julie, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have a story like this to, to tell about you yet. But I'm sure we're going to have a lot of great stories to tell about you in the future. 
but I happen to hear, and sorry, Carl, I'm just going to do it. I happen to hear that perhaps one day during school, last year in the school that you were in, you maybe you dressed up like an elf and drove around the, the school uh, on, a, on like a unicycle or something. Is there any truth to that, to that story, Mr. Lawson? Because we may have to rethink this appointment. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, is she on? He's on. Mr. Dietrich, can I unmute you? Yep, I just did. Okay, well, we're, we're going to have to talk. And, and, and honestly, if you, if you only did that once, Carl, you may have to do it more than that. Well, I'll do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, welcome aboard both Julie and Carl. Congratulations. Good, looking forward to working with you. I both. feel like Julie has something she wants to oh, say. Oh, Julie, have you also oh, dressed no, up like an elf? Is you riding a unicycle as well? Well, no. we didn't tell you that this is part of the initiation, Julie, and, and, and you do have to dress up like an elf later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sure will. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. No problem. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you
forward progress on some of them that we haven't gotten. Headway. Headway, thank you. Front page of the I can't think today. Um, my head's all over the place. So. Um, but yeah, so just make sure that if you have stuff you want to talk about next week, um, we can do that. Okay? Um, should we submit that to you ahead of time for we next can. week? We can. And we have yeah, I can put it together if that would be. Yeah. yeah. Cast week's we can, and then Ken has. <coughs> Yeah, if you could email to Amy and copy me, please, and okay. Jim, and and then I can put anything together so you have one sheet to, to work off of as you as you. Uh, are, we, are we anticipating that this is a one meeting discussion, or is it a multiple? Meeting? Usually, it's usually we do it over a couple of meetings. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be the beginning of it, and um, and Kathy will help us get started, possibly based on our um, <coughs> our self assessments that we're doing. Um, but then we'll talk about them again, and then we can talk about them as, as many times as we need to until we're comfortable yeah. approving them. Um, there's no, you know. I tell you why your idea is bad, you tell me why my idea is bad. And then we, we, then we go over why your idea is right. bad again. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Basically. Um, it usually takes two or three meetings, I would say, to, to make them both concrete. And, and yep. You know, it should. It should and this be. is in workshops when we do this. It is. Uh, well, our yeah. Well, our meeting next week is going to be during the general meeting. However, it's you know, it, as we know, we've been treating a lot of them as workshops. So I don't want anyone to think that you can't say as much as you want to say during right. that meeting. We don't yeah, need yeah. to, you know, we can we can initiate it and then go on and from there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Thank you. <coughs> I believe we're going to go to technology, right? Did you have something to talk about, Mr. Did we say um, that earlier? Well, I, guess yes. I, I guess I can say a couple of things. One okay. is... Um, can you talk about technology yep. just for the... Stand up or talk about it. Um, <laughs> well, I had a, had a, a brief conversation with uh, Mike, kind of like uh, Kelly and uh, Ken this afternoon, and uh, went through some um, anecdotally what's, what we're hearing from the schools. Um, and also I did some, uh, you know, just talking with some teachers and some parents about what they're experiencing. So, so statistically, um, uh, the environment that we have, we've had uh, for the infrastructure that we have, we have a two gigabyte, um, it went up to about two gigabytes for the maximum um, spike in our, in our environment, which, um, uh, which we lasted for only a short period of time. Um, the average was around uh, 0.8 of that. So, so we really were running about half of that and probably about 20% of our overall capacity. So the overall infrastructure, I think, was, was performing well. Um, clearly, we had some issues with teachers sometimes being dropped off from a Zoom session, um, which happened sporadically, but not consistently. Um, it didn't seem like teachers were off of the environment too long. They might have gotten kicked off and then went back on. So um, we've asked Mike Paul if he can um, track maybe some of the ones that may have had longer um, times where they couldn't get back on and seeing if that was a training issue or if there was something um, more systematic. Um, some of the things that we've heard were, you know, kids at home dropping off. So those are from their Wi-Fis and then they have to get back on. So that's a little bit of a a little bit of a challenge that I'm not sure how we uh, address that, you know. So, um, so overall, and I've heard that there's been a big improvement even from the first day to the second day, right? About less interruptions and and less intermittent issues. So, um, so overall, it looks like it's it, it looks like we're on a good path. Um, you know, I think the 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 other the other things that you hear are that at the elementary school level for kids to be able to stay on you know, these uh, sessions for four or five hours and do homework is a little taxing. And so you know, I think we all kind of support this discussion about that the younger grades, as soon as we can, can get back to school faster. Heard a lot less issues on the um, high school level. And, um, and overall, the, the teachers that have spoken to me and the, and the parents um, feel like it is going well. Teachers are, are having their game plans much more well thought out than it was in the springtime. And um, 
And we have some issues at the high school level where some of the <coughs> applications run on the desktop and don't run um, on the web, which creates, some, which creates some issues on how those documents, how those applications get shared and accessed. So Kelly is kind of looking into those things and figuring out what the, you know, what the workarounds are or what the, the new versions are for us to be able to, uh, to address. So I think the overall feeling is that um, uh, we are on a pace to have calmer waters from the first day, as we saw in the second day, and then as everybody gets more acclimated to what those those little glitches are that happen because of squirrels running along the internet occur, that you know we'll have have calmer waters. So that's the that's the overall feeling. <coughs> so I'm going to defer that now to maybe. Ken or Kelly, did, did I get that right about what we kind of have found? You want to go, Kelly? No, go ahead. I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add, I, th I think you, it's certainly accurate, is the, uh, is the help desk. You know, if there are issues to contact the help desk because we can see patterns and, and really try to, uh, you know, rectify any issues. Uh, You're saying if there's problems to contact the help desk. Yes, if there are problems, even at, at home, because they can give you tips of things to, to do at home, uh, th things to, to do at school. I know the technology department was pushing out some, uh, some best practices or some tips on things to do, things not to do that will help performance uh, of the different applications. I, I know one thing I was personally doing, uh, which I think everybody remembers where I had some problems, my, our initial meetings where I was breaking up on some of my, because um, I use a Google, uh, the Chromebook also, uh, you know, I like to multitask. I don't know why, but I do. And I had, a, I'd have a lot of tabs up, and that really, that that can hamper uh, some of the, the the systems. And so then once I had a conversation with, uh, I think it was Sean or one of the techs, said, oh, you can't, you have that many uh, tabs up, that that can slow down or it can it can hamper Zoom or, or things like that. So once I did that, then I haven't had a problem in months. So little things like that, they're trying to push out helpful tips and best practices, uh, you know, even where you're, you know, where you're state, you know, at, if you're at home, how close you are to a modem, th things like that. So little things can sometimes make a, a big difference. So I know the technology uh, people are, are working on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess also the instructional aids that are coming around are helping. And Mike Hall and his team are also going around to the different classrooms and watching how things are performing and, and kind of doing that. And I guess the last part was that some of the support issues or some of the performance issues might also be to some of the older Chromebooks mm -hmm. that are in some of the staff's hands. I think Jim talked about it at the very beginning. So, we, uh, so on those Chromebooks, you probably have want to have many less tabs. <laughs> right, right, and, but the you know, Not, no, right. no and we keep pushing, you know, because we put an order in at the end of June, right. and like many districts that uh, you know, that really couldn't even open because they didn't have Chromebooks. Luckily, we had enough uh, inventory to be able to to get things going, but it's not perfect as you yeah. as you said, and we we're hoping uh, beginning of November, uh, and don't and I can't guarantee it as I always say, but that's what they're telling us now that the the new delivery date is for our, the Chromebooks. And then also, uh, everybody remembers through budget, we are ordering uh, elementary uh, laptops for, for teachers. So that'll allow us to push uh, higher level uh, computers to uh, aides and, uh, and students to really uh, kind of rotate out some of the older uh, units. Yeah, and for everybody that, has, that does have problems, we have a lot of empathy for people having these problems. Right, especially when they're at home and dealing with their kids and, and figuring out, but you know, let us help you work through these and, and we'll come out to a better spot. Uh, Kel Kelly, did, did we miss anything? No, I think those. I think you hit most of uh, the issues that we're talking about. And like I said, you know, yes, I'm working on it, but my call has really uh, worked hard to try and fill some of the gaps with those courses at the high school. We've had some solution, but we know we still have a problem there, and we're still working on it. And that help desk number is easily accessible to parents? The phone number to contact the help desk? Or the email? Yeah, the email. email. Yeah, help desk. Uh, was it Kelly? At help Ocean. desk? At Ocean. Yeah, 
I, I think it's, I think it's in our, our parent-friendly version of our plan, but if it's not, we'll, we'll add it in there. Yeah. Um, okay. we'll Can I just suggest for things like that? I think a lot of times the information we push out to parents, it's an email, but then it's a link to a PDF of a letter that sometimes then has live links, but sometimes it has links that aren't live. So yeah. you're kind of pushing people through multiple steps, and a lot of people are accessing this via their phone. So by the time you get to that place where you have to click to see the plan, you might have already kind of given up in frustration. Okay. So you know maybe if some of that information could just be in its own email of if you're having problems, you know you, you go right to the help desk. You go to your teacher first, kind of explain that out, yeah. okay. and maybe in a sort of like a simple social yeah, media post. Yeah, so we can we can, yeah, we can, we can do that. That's what, one of the things we try to do with that is to have that alert. Um, yep. Fine. So that then, when you click on that, it kind of takes you to those places. But yeah, we can certainly do a separate Just notification. Sure. I mean, I probably, yeah, maybe 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 maybe. Sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But then, can can I ask what's the status of our of our list of webcams are? From from what I heard today, they were in Pennsylvania on their so way well, here. So you can, can almost them touch them. Yes. Touch them. So we, we do anticipate by the by the end of the week. Mike Mike Hall's been tracking them and seeing on the MapQuest where they are, and uh, so that was a conversation we had uh, today. Where did they start from? Wait a second. Yeah, that's why they're going to almost. That's why they're almost here. Started in Trenton. That's why they should be your next few days. Great. They got delivered to an Amish village. Those people know what the hell to do with them. Pennsylvania is not a quarantine state, so it's okay. Right, you go now. Uh, you can go and come back. Awesome. And come, back. And come back to school. Very good. Yeah. So I my truck. Six, Six days out. came off today, by the way. I know, I saw that. Vacation time. But now you can't go to Puerto Rico. Oh, you can't go to Puerto Rico. Damn it. Um, okay, so any other questions for about tech from anyone on the board? No? Okay. So, moving on to old business from the board. Oh, Mr. Hatton. Yes. Um, just a heads up that we will be moving the vote on the amendment to the superintendent's contract from the 13th to the 27th, so it will actually be at a regular meeting, a concern that was expressed by a couple of board members. So there will be a new uh, statement going out. Notice public notice. Notice public notice going out, and that vote will be held on the 27th. Thank you. Thank you. Of October. Of October. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I forgot to say earlier, and just wanted to make sure that all board members fill out the self uh, self assessment for from the um, from Kathy for um, really by today or tomorrow. So now. Yeah. You can do it. I thought I missed this. I thought you said it was Friday, so I did it really quick on it. Yeah, I guess. You scared me into the deadline. You two are <laughs> exceptional. Okay. All right, you get a gold star. I don't know where it will be, but I'll find you one. Um, okay, any other old business from any board members? Just one. So, yes, Ms. Fuller. Is yes. there anyone remote who wants to? I don't no, know. I can see your, I'm, look, I'm looking here and I can see your hand, so. Um, just have we understanding there's a lot of other things going on, but if we decided if we're going when we move forward with that posting of the PR position job posting for that part time person, uh, we talked about it. Ken and I talked about it today, and just getting the job the uh, the job description and the, and the posting together. Um, so hopefully within the next week or so, yeah. we'll be able to get that out. Because I think it could take obviously a lot of just kind of pushing out information off of yeah. your plate, right? Uh, yeah, I um. I was going to reach out to uh, Super at RBR, you know, because we had we had a uh, person in that capacity, grad, and, you know, get just kind of look at the job description of, of, of what we had. Right. So, let me get that, and you know, we'll have to approve the job description. And, and all, that. all right, thanks. Okay. Mr. White, oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, just wondering if there was an issue with the uh, bus runs because that's been resolved. The kids getting on the bus, having their temperatures taken. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have aides on the buses right now. Uh, that was discussed at, at uh, our task force meeting last week. Um, 
there were there were just some logistical issues that that arose over the last uh, week or so. We're hopeful to be able to get uh, some aids on on some buses. I, I basically. The, the aids on buses was was really an issue uh, that was going to be done in lieu of Wednesdays because it's all remote, so extra time Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, but more aids are are being utilized on on Wednesdays than we had anticipated, and we needed more aid. There were more bus runs than we had originally anticipated, so that created that created a little bit of an issue. So we're, we're working on it. Uh, we're, we're still hopeful that uh, we're going to be able to do that, at least in some capacity. I don't think we're going to have aids on all the buses because um, uh, you know the numbers just don't, don't, uh, don't add up in that way. But our original plan, we didn't anticipate aids on buses anyway as part of our original plan. So um, you know, the, the, uh, all of the students are being uh, temperature checked uh, prior to them entering the building. But I once again want to stress, and I've stressed this in our, you know, multiple communications that have gone out over the entire summer, is um, it starts at home. It starts at home. You know, the parents have to be the first step. And if their children are not feeling well, they, they should absolutely keep them home. And then we have the checklist. Everybody has the checklist, or at least we've sent it out. Um, so if you, if, you, if you follow that health checklist, which is directly from the, the New Jersey Department of Health, and that's the, that's the first one. So. Thank you. Okay. Jeff? Um, Ken, I think we one of the, one of the things in the last meeting, we talked about maybe giving us a little tally of how we were doing against our expenses related to doing things around this COVID pandemic era uh, and how that's uh, mapping against our bucket of money that we kind of rolled over. And I was wondering if you... Uh, yeah, I, I'm still working. Still working on it. Still working on it. But I, I can give you some o a quick overall. Is that bad terminology? Yeah. 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 I can give you a, a quick overall. Uh, to date, we've we've uh, spent about five hundred seventy-five thousand dollars on uh, PPE, uh, including the whole list of everything from temperature kiosks to tents to. Everything that you know you, you saw when you walked uh, through the buildings, uh, so it, it, it's a lot. Now, two hundred seventy-seven thousand of that was covered under the the CARES Act, and uh, and I and also have an application in with FEMA to try to cover some some of that, a small part of that. And I know Janice saw the article, and maybe some of the other board members did uh, that just recently came out where they're going to be scaling back some of what is a qualified expense for FEMA. So working through all that, so I'm not sure right now how much is going to be covered uh, by FEMA. And I'm not sure how much, we, and we've talked about this, I think, at our last meeting, and, and uh, I have a head custodian meeting tomorrow where after our first two days of school uh, to sit down and go over our inventories to really see what we've used in the first two days to really try to get an idea of where we're going to be and try to project out uh, for, the, for the rest of the year and see what that number is going to be. Now, and as you mentioned, we had uh, the maintenance reserve that we had established last year because we had saved money yeah. from March to June on things like daily substitutes. And just think of the, the, the big operation that, you know, some of it we didn't, ha we didn't have to do, so there were some savings there. So we moved that money to our, our uh, maintenance reserve account just for this, because we knew this was coming. So right now we're still okay, but the big, the big things are end of this month we'll know Gov Governor Murphy uh, and the legislature what, what the, uh, and we're, we're hopeful and we're I'm much more positive now than I was a few months ago as far as our state aid goes, that they're going to maintain that at, at the, that was Governor Murphy's proposal. Uh, now hopefully that won't change. You know, in the last two years now it has changed. So uh, not a, you know, so hopefully that that won't be an issue. Uh, but once we get through that, and then also r really seeing how we're going to be going forward for the rest of this year, and also understanding that you know other parts of the budget where we've taken a hit, such as on the revenue side where we lost uh, a Camp David, and and uh, in you know next meeting I, I'd love to talk again about our indoor use of facilities. You know we haven't gone there yet 
So some of the churches and some of the groups that normally pay us a, a facility fee to utilize our buildings, we haven't done yet, of course, or, or, or allowed because we want to make sure that the cleanliness and, and everything is there before we can think about bringing outside groups back into our building. So I don't know if we're getting closer there or not, but you know, it, only two days in, as far as school goes, we still need a little more time to evaluate that. So that's a, a quick snapshot. Uh, you know, I hope to give the board a more detailed uh, look. Uh, and but I uh, but I need a few more weeks just to see okay. how things are are, are progressing. I won't, I won't ask you next week. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ken, can I ask on the FEMA issue? Is there any talk among school districts in New Jersey or kind of all over the place of you know passing resolutions of asking FEMA to reconsider their reconsideration of the reimbursement? Is there anything that we should be? Uh, that's a good thought. I, I haven't seen anything yet. Usually something that, that school boards would usually come up with something like that and send out a, a sample resolution for, for people to, to do, but I, I can look into that. I have a question for Ken. One more question. So tomorrow is our first um, remote day where everybody's out of the building. Can you give us a brief overview of how that's going to work as far as cleaning that's different from perhaps another day? Uh, sure. We have a we have checklist that each that everyone's working off of. So I mean, a lot of it will be the same, but then things that uh, such as uh, plexiglass, things like that, will be the, that are you know between the groups of kids will be uh, will be wiped down and clean. So it, it's just more of a, a lot of it's the same, but a lot of it's more detailed areas that we may not do every night. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a general, uh, you know, for, for the most part, a lot of things we're doing every day, such as playgrounds and water fountains and, and a lot of high touch points. And so we're, we're doing that uh, every day, but there are some things like plexiglass is a big thing that pops in my mind. Uh, that we don't do every day, but we will be doing on our you know Wednesday clean. We're we're calling it. The buses, I'm sure, are getting a bigger. Buses, well, our our bus drivers is part of, because the majority of them will not have runs. Right. Uh, now some of them will be working from 12 to 3, which is our food service. Oh, I knew it. I forgot someone. Our food service mm -hmm. people, Sodexo. Yes. In the beginning, I forgot to mention mm -hmm. Sodexo and everyone who, who works on the food service. I'm sorry, uh, but they, they've been they've been great. And you talk about procedures going out the window, and with teachers, and the teachers have been great. And the online ordering is getting better and better. We're you know starting that with the parents online ordering, and uh, for our in for our physically uh, in person students. So that that's coming along, and, and that's going to be a really good thing once once we get a uh, you know everybody online and and, and used to it. Uh, so I did forget them. I knew it. Uh, I'm sorry, where, where was I? <laughs> Cleaning. <laughs> Cleaning. Cleaning of the buses. Cleaning of the buses. Yes, yeah, so the, the uh, food, so bus drivers will be doing food service distribution from 12 to 3, and then they're also on shifts coming in and uh, disinfecting and cleaning their, their own buses, too. So that's their Wednesday because they, most of them don't have buses. Some of them still, some of them still have routes, right. maybe out of district uh, schools or things of that nature. But so everyone is still uh, expected to... Uh, to have some duties on a Wednesday. Okay. Right, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so at this time, we will move on to public comment on any item at this time. Um, Mr. Dietrich, I think we should go back to Mrs. Hayes just on the one comment and the one question. I believe, Mrs. Hayes, that it was about what do the nurse's offices look like for the isolation rooms. Is that correct? Um, I still, you're still getting a ton. Of, I'm getting a ton of feedback. So sorry. Are there? I can't hear everything you're saying. For our help desk. Just go over what the holding room 
are going to look like? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know, Jen, Jen, I mean, you, you oversee the nurses, Jen, do you, do you want to look at that? I mean, there's, the, most of them are they're part of the, the current, uh, you know, where the current nurse's office is, space within that. Jen, can you, can you go over that a little bit? Sure, I'm just, I might need a little clarification on the question. So when the ch children get off the bus, if they were have a temperature or identified as having a, a temperature, they would be, there is like a cooling tent at each school where they would be escorted to go to. Um, the nurses there, um, sometimes if they're, it's obvious that the child would not be feeling well, and then they would be escorted to into the school to the isolation room. All isolation rooms are within you know, the first couple of feet of entering the building, or so, um, 100 feet or so. And then the parents would be called. A lot of times that it's just, you know, that speculation at this point, not necessarily today because it's cooler, but that they would be overheated from being on the bus or the temperature, humidity, something like that would affect their temperature. Jen, another part of the question was as far as entrances into the isolation room. Are there multiple entrances or? or no, there's only one entrance and one exit. And there could be two kids if, I mean, if luck were to not have, unfortunately, luck were to have it, two kids could be sharing the same space. If they're put in the isolation room at the same time and they both have fever, that's what I'm saying. That is not something that has been an issue. Um, the nurses have not brought that as a concern that they wouldn't have additional space if they need it. Um, I believe that they, everyone's worked with their principals as far as a plan if they had multiple children sick and where to go. Um, I have a follow-up, I'm gonna ask can, can I just add something to that? J just to add, because I know, our, you know, over the summer, our, our maintenance crew, we, uh, in some of the instances, in each, in, you know, each uh, building is different, but where we uh, went to an adjacent room and opened up the room uh, to the nurse's office and created more space in the nurse's office. And then uh, they put up tracks with clear uh, plastic and, uh, and also uh, added uh, hydroxyl air scrubbers in those rooms to try to give uh, as sterile an environment uh, as possible. And uh, they worked with the nurses to do that. So I just know a little bit about the physical setup of, of those rooms. And, and also, Alex, in some cases, but not all, like for example, at the high school, there are multiple ways into the nurse's office so that you know kids who are coming down for uh, non um, you know, symptom-related kinds of things do not necessarily have to interact with the kids who are going into an isolation space. Um, and I think in many cases, those isolation rooms are very close to the main entrance, so kids don't have to walk deep into, if they don't have a separate entrance, they don't have to walk deep through to get to get to it. Um, I can't say that in all, in all cases, but in, in many cases, we, we try to do that. Okay, that is, that is very helpful, thank you. Um, and my second question is, um, I know pickup is tomorrow, 12 to 3 for the um, school pickup. Um, so uh, what do we do for parents who are working and they can't get there for 12 to 3? Um, how is the district going to you know, get to either the kids or the parents that so much would like to be there and get the kids? Is there a plan for that? Well, I, I would, uh, you know, right now I don't, I don't, I can't say that we have a specific plan for that. I think if, if there's a parent who falls into that category and they want to contact us and, and let us yeah. know their situation, then we can try to work out. Yeah, uh, I'm sure each school will have ample yeah, uh, I mean, meals, so if someone calls, they could, I'm right. sure they could hold it. You know, last, last year, um, you know, if, if, if people couldn't get there between nine and eleven, which were the times we always kept, you know, food in, in the I think that's what you're talking about. Are you talking about the people that are all remote that are picking up their books? Or are you talking about food service? No, I'm talking about food service. Okay. Food okay. service. So we keep we keep a number on on site for those parents who couldn't get there at that particular time. The issue um, would be, of course, if a parent is getting there at five thirty or six o'clock. Um, we may not be there, you know, so that's a, that is a real question, but perhaps we can work out to where a parent could stop by, you know, first thing in the morning the next day prior to work or something like that, and I'm sure we can accommodate them. If they contact their principal, you know, I'm sure we can work to try to, to, try to accommodate that parent. I have another question. Um, I know that 
don't know off the top of my head as to exactly what was used, but I, I believe it was very close. Um, great. I have more, so if you want to go back and forth, whatever you want to do. Yeah, we'll come back in and we'll have a couple of people behind you. Okay, next up.
involved in, in this. Um, and it actually also, um, Ms. White's question just now really, uh, it, she is doing something that, that can be done online. Um, back in 2017, I gave a uh, growth mindset um, presentation at the start of the school year, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Marcy Abramowitz um, ran with, with it, uh, learned about something called LearnStorm. Um, that, and uh, that year we actually were, uh, it's Khan Academy's um, growth mindset set of activities. Um, and it's all about, you know, grit and perseverance and, you know, failing is not, uh, um, failing is part of the learning process, things like that. Um, anyway, Mrs. Abramowitz, um, that year we became uh, grand, uh, grand prize finalists. Her efforts have really become fantastic. Uh, she has gotten other connections teachers at the uh, intermediate school to, to teach growth mindset using LearnStorm. Um, it is, um, I think Ken, you'll like this word, it is an absolutely free resource. Um, and I'm sure Marcy would be glad to help anybody with it. I think it would be fantastic for the elementary students to, uh, to be involved in it. It's completely done online for free, and uh, I, I just was compelled to discuss um, this fantastic uh, social emotional growth mindset resource that uh, I think is underutilized in our district. And uh, we have a, literally a growth mindset guru in the intermediate school. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. the, um, I guess, messaging around um, temperatures, uh, you know, being taken or now not being taken at the bus stop. Um, my concern is that I think the majority of uh, parents, definitely elementary school parents, got the messaging, um, you know, from those fantastic videos from our elementary school principals showing that our kids were going to um, have their temperature taken at the bus stop. And perhaps even though maybe there was a line item maybe in the, in the last, um, you know, letter that came from the district, I can probably guarantee you that a lot of parents are, are not aware of that change. And if we're now saying that it starts at home and we want parents to take the responsibility of checking their temperatures at home, I think there needs to be a much stronger message sent um, directly. It just that, not with a bunch of other stuff, saying we are no longer taking temperatures at the bus stop and we need you to be responsible at home to check temperatures. Because um, I can probably guarantee you that a lot of parents are unaware of that at this time. Thank you. Okay, circling back to Alex. Okay, I think I'm unmuted, and I hope I fixed my volume a little bit better. You did. Okay. Um, so, in, um, I just wanted to ask, I guess it's um, Mr. Janero, if you don't mind. Um, I'm looking at the public notice in the press on September 11th that was only online for about 24 hours regarding the superintendent's contract hearing. And it does say copies of the proposed addendum to the contract are available for review on the district's website. And I've been, you know me, I'm good at research. I've been looking for a while um, and I don't see it. So can you tell us where it is? Um, and also send me a copy and I believe I heard that in the past we used to send it out in our web backpack um, when we have public hearings like this. Will that be done? Uh, and I don't know if you heard Mr. Haddon, but the, the date was moved from the 13th uh, that was specified in that public notice to the uh, 27th. So a new public notice will be uh, uh, published in the newspapers. So uh, I will I'll send you that new public notice. And the contract until it is, once it's approved by the county superintendent, then I, I'll send it right to you, which uh, will probably take another, uh, uh, at least a couple more days before it's approved by the county office. And then, uh, then I'm allowed to release it to you or to anyone. But on Friday, it did say copies of the proposed addendum are available for review. So I, can I get that Friday copy? That was available on Friday? No, it's not available until until the uh, county superintendent approves it. Okay. 
Okay, so is this public notice or incorrect? That just doesn't specify as to exactly when. Yeah, it will, it, it'll be available as soon as the county office uh, approves it, which I hope will be in a couple more days. Okay, I'll look forward to chatting with you more about that. Sounds um, good. And then I have my second question, which is kind of more like a, a, a start off with a comment. Um, it's a very quiet, subdued word that I use. It's rather unusual. Um, but I, I think we're getting a little bit of a disconnect with parents' opinions about parenting support and administrators. Um, Can you, I can't hear you, Alex. Can you hear you? Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, just as I said, I think there's a disconnect between your guys' opinions of testing scores and many parents. The superintendent tonight called those AP scores terrific, and I think they were horrific. It makes me think of last year how we were told that Dow Avenue State testing scores you know, went from a 20% passing rate the year before, and they moved up to a whopping 30% passing rate when we had one mass at about 75%, and the state average at about 55%. You all um, said that was the good scores. So this leads me to the New Jersey School Performance Report, since it was just recently you know, made public. Um, when are we going to be talking about all the test scores? Um, you know, I, I did not see much improvement, um, and but. You know, Ms. Weldon does an amazing job of explaining things, so perhaps that's coming. Um, you know, we still have ELA Latino students at OTES scoring at 11%, when whites scored at 42% and black students scored at 26 um, So I'm just wondering when we're going to be going over the most recent state um, issued test scores, and will that be before our early we, at this point, we have we have publicly I have publicly presented all of our most recent test scores. I believe it was this past May where I shared out the fall scores. I believe it was the May meeting, and there are no other scores to be presented at this point until we until students sit for new tests. We also reviewed the you know mentioned the school performance reports at that time which were just include data that I had presented in the fall, last fall. So the school performance reports are a year behind yes. what we're talking about. So the school performance report that is re was released last spring includes the data that I presented in October, I believe it was October of 2019. Yep. But since you presented in October of 2019, I just wonder like, when is so the reason why I won't be presenting this October is because there were no tests last spring. So normally I take everything that happened in a school year, 2019 to 20, the fall testing at the high school, the access testing for our ELLs, the spring testing for all students K-12 to and all ELM testing for special ed and present it in the fall because that's when we, we get the results in the summer. But because of the pandemic, there was no testing in the spring at all last year, so I presented everything we had done last fall, and now I just presented the AP scores, which was the only thing left to present that was that the students sat for last year. So at this moment in time, there are no other test scores to present until our students sit again this year for what we believe will be our fall block NJSLA access, and then spring testing. We, we, the state has said right now that we will be testing, although they have not put out any calendars or any testing windows or any guidance whatsoever, but they are telling us to prepare for testing, so we are. And so after we have new scores, we will, I will report those performance reports out to the public. So are we doing any assessments of our teachers are we doing um, Initial assessments. I thought that they were saying like give it a couple of weeks and then we're we're going to try to assess. The teachers will do those formative assessments in their classrooms, but we do not report those out to the public. We we report out the state assessments. Now a parent can have information about their own child at any time, and they can get that through their teacher and their principal about their own child. <laughs> I would take on the that as well. Just to let me speak, Dr. Sanger. These kids were in the 
middle of a pandemic, learning virtually with teachers teaching them virtually. I pulled up those scores. Our biology went up. Our calculus went up. Our calculus BC went from 3.5 average to 4.1 average. For these kids to hear someone in the public say that those scores are horrific, when we have marked improvement in nearly all, if not all, areas where our kids test, that breaks my heart. Could we improve? Are we always looking to improve? Absolutely. But to take those scores that these kids achieved, which wasn't holding the line, which was a marked improvement in nearly every testing area, and to say that those are horrific, with no comparison, with no justification for that, it breaks my heart and to what it does to those kids and those teachers who work so hard. And we encourage all of our kids to take the test. We don't cherry pick. Just like Ms. Kasuba is talking about, Dr. Stavinks is talking about, we encourage kids not only to take the courses, not just selecting the, 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 the most obvious kids, encouraging all these kids to take these classes, and then paying for all of them to take the test. So that all of that is in here. We don't cherry pick to improve our scores. And even doing so, all of our scores improved in the middle of a pandemic under learning conditions that no one has ever had to deal with before. I'm sorry, I'm upset by that, and I can't let it go unchecked mm -hmm. that we're going to let those scores and the work of those kids be called horrific. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. I agree. Well said, Janice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree, Janice. Agree. I know those high school teachers and how hard they work on those AP curriculum yeah, I courses. think it's pretty amazing myself. If there is an issue with testing and like concerns that. about testing at school, we understand that. And there are disparities and there are discrepancies that we all work hard and the administration works hard to improve every single day. But to insult and to, to demean the kids who took those tests and the teachers who got them ready for it, and not just last year, but all the teachers who taught them up to that moment, getting them ready for that test, it is unfair to the work that is done in this district to call those tests. Well, but also, the scores, the scores didn't say that. They didn't say no, that. They no, they said the exact opposite. But even if they did, even if those it's scores better. went down last year, I think we all would have understood that if those scores went down with all that those kids were dealing with mm -hmm. and the way the test was administered and the tech problems, et cetera. But they went up. Yeah. They went up. Significantly. Commendable. Very significantly. Yeah. Commendable. Yeah. I wish we could have all these kids and all these teachers here in person, and I look forward to the day when this room is full mm -hmm. again, and we could recognize this work and congratulate those kids. Absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Do we have other comments, Mr. Dietrich? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Erica McCann. Go ahead, Erica. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. spaces to come and sit in bleachers so yeah they know they will be there and right. actually actually if they sit if the kids sit in the bleachers then they're considered part of that 500 so we got to be mindful okay i was just thinking like i hate to see a tuba player get tackled on that <laughs> actually if you if you've seen some of them they actually are pretty good i mean you know they, i think they can they can take a few kids out if you ask me <laughs> <laughs> At least the woodwinds, definitely. I mean, certainly the, the bassoon player and probably the bass, bass uh, drum. Exactly. I don't think we have a tuba this year. Um, but anyway, the other question I had actually on a serious note was the uh, attendance. I was looking at my power school, and Mrs. Weinstein told me that there was a problem because I was getting like uh, absences on my freshmen and my sixth graders. Uh, power schools that were not correct, mm -hmm. and if as and Mrs. Weinstein was telling me that if a teacher uses an RLP remote learning present, present right? 
right, um, that it's not showing correctly in power school. We are addressing that issue, and I believe it, I believe it was already rectified, but if you, we are working on that issue, and that will be corrected. So that's not something that we individually need to let you know about if we're seeing it? No, that's okay. And then another thing that came up in the past two days of, you know, or however many days of remote learning that we've been doing, um, on Monday my son tried to get into a classroom, and he wasn't able to do it. I don't know what was going on with the link. He couldn't get through. Other children were able to. Um, by the time he got, there was another link that was posted, and by the time he got on that link, um, it was a problem for the teacher that he came on, and, you know, but it threw him into a complete loop, uh, to, you know, like, you know, we're talking about the FCL, and, you know, trying to support these students and the teachers, you know, um, you know, when a kid comes on and they're that late, and they've been trying for 40 minutes to get on, um, the reaction to him just kind of was tough, let's put it that way. And, and that ruined him for the next class. Um, so, what I was trying to figure out is, how do those absences count, so that I can try and explain to him, like, he, the link that came on didn't come on, the link that finally worked didn't actually show up in Google Classroom until almost 9.40. You know, he was trying to get on at 8 o'clock. Um, is that an absence for him? I mean, well, I, how I would, does that work? I would, I would think that if a child had a, had a techno, tech, technology issue that, that prevented them from getting present, that, from being present, that's not, that's not their fault. So, you know, I think, I think you should, you know, contact the teacher, and if the, mm -hmm. the teacher doesn't quite see it that way, or if there's an issue, or, or you know, if the, you're not quite seeing eye to eye on that, then contact the guidance counselor, you know, and or, 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 or your principal, and, and they can look into the situation, and, you know, and, and see how we can, can rectify that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that it was disruptive for him to come in at that point, and it was hard, it's hard on the teachers to try and keep the attention of the class both there and remote yeah. at that point, and it was a disruption, I'm sure, but, you know, it was, it was tough, because yeah. it took us a while to kind of get past that. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that occurred. Um, you know, obviously, as I said, you know, the, the, everything is, is right now a work in progress, and you know, every day there's going to be these hiccups that that occur. Hopefully, they get less and less every day. But you know, I would I would, I would reach out to the teacher first and foremost and just try to talk that through. Um, you know, and, and, I kind of did, but I didn't get a response. Okay, uh, then, then I would reach out. You know, you could certainly reach out to to break your principal, and, and I'm sure that they can make them work to help you out with that. Okay, um, and then the last question, and then I will leave you alone. Um, how long do you think it'll take to get those webcams installed once you've received them? Because I think that's going to help some of the stress levels for the teachers as well as the students. Because right now the students are looking at the I don't know if you realize that the students are looking at this. Well, the truck's in Pennsylvania right now. <laughs> And, uh, and like, you you're driving 53 yeah. miles an hour on Route 80, and they're going to be here uh, almost. Yeah. Right. Is it Philadelphia? I hope so. Okay. It'll take a few more days after they get here. Yeah. Well, Remember, most we of, talked about we've done a lot of the yeah, wiring. We've done a lot of it, but there's still more to do as far as uh, the brackets and the wiring. Yeah. Yeah, that's a safe, that's a safe bet. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.
um, where are we in this process and will we have this happening by this year? That's Jen. Jen, can, That's you, can you address that? Yes, so the case managers have the card. It was approved by the DOE um, and they are going to be implementing them with the families during the annual reviews. So the DOE approved the card that you sent to me that was nothing like the card they sent to you? Yes. Um, just finishing up with Alex. So go ahead and ask a couple more and then we'll finish up with Alex. Okay. Um, special education strategic planning meeting. I, I think that we are all pretty much know how to handle a Zoom now. Can we get this back, wheels back in motion? Especially yeah, we, talk, we talked yeah. about that last week and with. And yeah, I know. Uh, Kathy right now is away. Uh, so as soon as she comes back, um, we will we will set a date for both uh, the Dell Avenue and uh, special services uh, final meeting. Yeah, because the, the, the one thing that has changed for special services is the, the gaps are getting okay. Um have, Has there ever been precedent set with the board when establishing their goals, taking suggestions from the public? Um, privately, not in a public forum, but maybe opening it up to, we, we had, we've had unprecedented attendance for the last couple of months. Maybe this is a good public relations moment to say, hey, we're establishing our goals. What would you like to see? Send us an email at doe at oceanschools.org. Um, there has not, to my knowledge, up until this point. Um, I would have to ask, um, we could ask Kathy about it next week, but I, I don't know. I don't, know I, mean, I don't see why there's a. I don't so it's all going to be part of a public meeting. Yeah, it's going to be a public meeting, so I, you know. The goals are always developed as part of a public meeting. Yeah. I think we've taken input from the public in the past when we've when they've been on the agenda. People have. I think um, we should. Yeah. yeah. We have but verbally. Yeah. yeah. Verbally, but I don't know about the specific. I mean, you're more than welcome, or anybody on this call is more than welcome to email them to me, um, and I can um, kind of weave them into our discussion. Um, a. McGovern at OceanSchools.org. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, um, not, but Dr. Stefankowitz, I, I know you were joking earlier about the, the thermometers reading you at 96. No, I wasn't. They were actually re reading me at 96. My nurse, 96 radar, my nurse radar went right up when you said that because what happens if either, if we're either not using good equipment or the people that are using them aren't using them properly because what happens if we have someone who is at 100.4 and is reading them at 98.4, we're blind to that inconsequential symptom, as I describe it, but we're blind to that symptom. So are we, um, it, it was just concerning to me. I'm putting it out there in your capable hands to do with what you think is best, but if it's reading inappropriate, then we need to address it. They, they, they. I know all of them have been calibrated. I, I, I you know, TMI moment. I, I do check traditionally run, run cool. I, I, I've checked myself against my own thermometers at home, and that is not atypical. So I, I think it's, you know, I think it's pretty. Uh, yeah, right. I'm just drained, man. You know, this is. Reptilian. I'm just run cold. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they're, I don't think they're too far, too far off. I right. thought you were going to diagnose him with something. I right know. Now. Yeah, was like, I was coming. <laughs> no. What do I have to do right now? I do, I do <laughs> usually need a blanket, Cindy. You know, <laughs> I, I am often cold. So. <laughs> Please. Um, the very last thing that I have is the Open Public Meeting Act does allow for distribution of public meeting notices through electronic means, such as utilizing the internet. And I really think that using the newspaper while it's still necessary because the law is in. Um, we have a great mechanism that you guys put in place years ago. We have this, you know, email blasts that go out all the time. Why are we not utilizing?
do thank Cindy for um, her words, and I was actually going to speak as to why I was muted, because I wasn't told how to respond to Janice's response. Um, I don't mean all of the scores were horrific, but um, I do see some pretty low scores in the last three years, so that wasn't my point, and I see a lot. Which um, specifically are you referring to? I've seen a lot of like one and a half. But if we were I mean, speaking, you said this, the most recent scores that Ms. Walden updated us on. No, that's not what I said. I said today's presentation had some like horrific scores. Because there's three years worth of scores here. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few that are 1.5s out of the five. Mm -hmm. So that was my point. My question is resource teachers. Um, at a dad, for example, um, they went from like, I, I don't know if it was second, third, and fourth grade, some teachers had an extra teacher in the classroom. And this year, I think it's kindergarten, third, and fourth. I'm presuming that's an other school, too. But could you guys explain for, I mean, as Dr. Spankler's thoughts? Could you, like, was there a reason behind this? Did some certain grades seem to clearly need uh, classrooms with a resource teacher? Um, I'm not, I want to believe it wasn't just arbitrary. So. You're talking about re resource teachers you're talking about? Yeah, the classroom, the classroom resource teacher. Well, I mean, obviously every every principal looks at the population of their students and, and determines where, you know, I mean, if you're talking about resource, you're talking about special education. So, you know, obviously that could be driven by IEPs or, or a variety of different things. I think, you know, probably reaching out to Ms. Leposnik to, you know, kind of get a sense of, of, of you know, the specifics of, of what you're talking about is probably the best avenue to follow there. Okay, so it's building by building. Okay, I'm Yeah, it's where the needs are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dietrich, anybody else? Yep, one more. Uh, Lindsay Hayes. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, it's Lindsay Hayes. Hey, this is Ken Drive in Waveside. I can you say that. Thank you. Uh, I'm pretty new to these meetings since Junior, my kid is four, so uh, I may have missed if there's anything related to this already happening. Um, I was just wondering if there are any diversity and inclusion initiatives happening currently in district um, to help close the gaps between our schools and the performance across different populations inside of them. Yeah, so um, Ms. Hayes, we, we in the district, uh, we do a lot of things um, to, to address um, those issues, we've we've run um, a lot of uh, building level ed camps and PD to address um, uh, addressing opportunity gaps and, and addressing uh, uh, cultural um, uh, cultural diversity. Um, we require training of all of our uh, staff members on on uh, bias, um, and we are members of the Central Jersey Consortium for Excellence. And, Equity, which is a group out of Monmouth University that provides professional development for their staff members and also uh, provides uh, learning opportunities for students, leadership opportunities for students. Um, Ms. Weldon um, also just uh, worked with a group of staff members to develop a, a group of resources. Kelly, can you, uh, can you address that, please? Absolutely. Um, over the last few months, I've been working first with my county group to work on uh, sharing out resources in equity across the county, but also in Ocean Township, a small group of, of staff members started the work this summer, which we hope will continue um, throughout the year and, and in future years that really focuses in on a couple key goals, which is more, more meaningful, more actionable professional development for teachers, um, a mentoring program for students across the district, uh, our hope is that older students, high school age students, can work to mentor younger uh, students in our district, outreach to parents as well, and alumni. And some of that outreach to alumni did take place this summer, and we're hoping to expand 
I'm hoping to work with the, with the staff members who are willing to, to be part of this to expand that and to um, you know, make those experiences drive some things that we may do to, to improve in our district. We also provide all new all new staff members with uh, uh, cultural competency training that Ms. Lepoznik and I uh, 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 provide. Uh, there's a there's a number of things that, that we do to address um, pro from a professional development standpoint. Um, also, we 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 had very strong success this year in our hiring practices, um, which which is a board goal um, that uh, we're we're very happy about as well. Dr. Stefankowitz, may I add to that? Of course. Dr. Stefankowitz and I, uh, am I unmuted? You you're, are, you're fine. You're yeah, because you're both okay. Dr. Stefankowitz and I uh, attended a meeting of the African American Culture Club, Ms. Hayes, in the spring. And of course, this was one of their main goals. And I hope also to, when we have our meeting about goals, make social justice and uh, acceptance, tolerance, and equity uh, uh, a distinct goal as we move forward into the next school year. And in meeting with those students, they had many concerns about the way history is portrayed, for example, uh, in the history books and how we might add additional programs and speakers to uh, help even the playing field and expose everyone to the accomplishments of everyone in our American history. Great. Um, are there any members of the community that are involved um, to assist, like parents? No. One of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about last year was, um, you know, district-wide um, sort of diversity group, which we were using our instructional council to, you know, address a lot of issues related to diversity. But I think once we get rolling this year, we'd like to expand that to be uh, beyond that group um, and be a separate group that will, you know, engage um, members of the community as well as our staff members. But let's uh, let's get school open, let's get started, and then you know we can we can you know develop that uh, develop that group. And you know we have a lot of groups that that uh, work together and they work in conjunction. Obviously, our wellness group and and. Um, all students feeling welcome and feeling part of, of one community is really important, but at the same time acknowledging um, you know, the, the individual cultures of different groups within our schools is, is, is very important as well. As a matter of fact, today is the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month, let's, let's you know, speak to that, and uh, that's always a great um, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for us to um, celebrate diversity and to uh, uh, celebrate uh, Latina culture and Latino culture in, in our schools and our community. So there's a, there's a lot of great things that, that we can do to engage our community to help us in these efforts. So Mrs. Hayes, we'll put your name on the side when we get to that point. Yeah, if you're volunteering, if you're volunteering, you're volunteering <laughs> we will put your name we over. We'll have Mr. Uh, General hold on to your name so that we know to contact you. Well, if you if you can tell I can barely breathe. I'm like almost eight months pregnant, but oh. <laughs> yeah, we actually can't tell that. Right? No, we can't. <laughs> can't tell that. Your picture looks the same as it did four months ago. So you <laughs> look great. You really look great. You're, 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 it's going well. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else, Mr. Dietrich? No, that's it, Madam President. Hi, may I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. May I have a second? Second. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.